After ironing out all the kinks and then knocking down all the hurdles, we have finally got the Ryzen 9 7950X running as best as it can be for today's review. And in today's review, I'm gonna be focusing on productivity numbers as well as gaming numbers. But before we get onto those numbers, let's take a look at the test system here, which features the X670E Tai Chi from ASRock, as well as 6,000 megahertz CL36 Expo Kingston Fury memory. However, I did cross-examine these numbers with also a pair of 6,000 megahertz XMP Vengeance Corsair memory sticks just to make sure if you say for instance come into a good deal on XMP profile memory for DDR5 is it going to be okay to just get those sticks instead of the Expo stuff and not have to pay a premium if it does exist in the market and the good news there is that there is no discernible difference between the two kits at least in the numbers that I'm showing here today though for the cooler we are using the Corsair H170i and this is where if you want to get the max performance out of the box and you don't want to change any settings, you will need a good cooling solution. Though as it stands, in my opinion, this architecture is geared up towards someone who has quite a lot of income at their disposal and they need the latest and greatest CPU to save time in the respective application that they're going to use it for, aka productivity. So let's get into those benchmarks straight away. We've got here Cinebench R23. This is the most popular mainstream benchmark just for simply measuring single core and multi-core performance. And here's where you've got chart topping scores on the multi-core average with coming in 37,615 points, as well as on single core, we got to 1,972 points. Though if you decide to undervolt this CPU, here's where you'll lose a little bit of performance, but you will, in my opinion, significantly gain a lot of power efficiency. I did a separate video on this, I'll put the link up here, where we managed to nearly cut the power consumption in half, as well as dropping those CPU temperatures drastically, where we got from 94 degrees in these Cinebench results down to 55 degrees. So massive gains to be had if you are into undervolting. Go on to the next benchmark, which is V-Ray 5. And this is another rendering benchmark like Cinebench. And here is where yet again, you've got a performance figure that is basically in another league compared to the CPUs that are currently out there, the i9-12900K and also its previous model, the 5950X where you've got 28,782 points versus the next best run up 20,430 points versus the i9-12900K at 18,987 points. Though onto Geekbench 5, and here's where it's a similar scenario to the previous two benchmarks with the 7950X coming out with the high score on the single core and the multi-core, as opposed to Cinebench, the i9-12900K did edge that out in the single core. There'll be something to talk about a little bit later in the conclusion because this CPU is boosting up to 5.7 gigahertz on the single core out of the box. And then to all cores, it's going to roughly 5.1 gigahertz. Now this is in a 26 degree ambient environment. Though at these levels, you can see it is getting a significant performance boost over previous generation 5950X. However, I decided to downclock this CPU to four gigahertz, and here's where I wanted to do an IPC comparison to the 5950X. And I was a little bit surprised to see here that I was only getting around 3% IPC increase in Cinebench R23. So this does differ a little bit to the 13% that AMD was promising in their geo mean average. And also they did say 9% IPC boost in Cinebench, I believe off the top of my head. However, when I clock these both to four gigahertz, I am getting some results that do differ in this test. And as you can see, the 12900K, at least in this benchmark, is showing that it does have the best IPC. So back to those productivity benchmarks, here's where we have Corona 1.3, again, chart topping performance, where in this time around, getting the fastest rendered time is the best outcome. And here you can see, it beats the 5950X by quite a sizable margin. And then we move on to seven zip compression and decompression benchmarks. Here's where the 7950X again delivered quite a sizable boost over anything else in the charts. The last benchmark we'll pull up for you guys is some food for thought. This is the Adobe Premiere Pro 2022 Puget Bench benchmark. Now this Puget Bench suite includes a lot of different scenarios. It includes things like scrubbing as well. So when you incorporate all these things, the Intel CPU does come out on top, providing you have the iGPU enabled, which of course, if you're buying a 12900K, you're going to have 
that on by default, or you're gonna at least have it at your disposal, so your wires will use it, and so it does come out ahead in this benchmark when you have that enabled. Unfortunately, at the moment, the Ryzen 9 7950X, although it has an iGPU, it's currently not supported in Premiere Pro. So hopefully this is something that AMD can work on and then top the charts in this benchmark going forward. Then the final thing to talk about is PCIe Gen 5, which is offered on this new Ryzen launch. So if you can utilize, say for instance, a PCIe Gen 5 SSD and you do need those speeds, then this will provide that compatibility. Though now it's finally time to segue into the gaming benchmarks and what better a way to segue than with Fire Strike Extreme Physics Score, where we scored here 45,455 points, beating that of the i9-12900K and also beating that of the 5950X. Now, this is one of those benchmarks that I find is actually kind of accurate in terms of getting an overall score on how it will perform in a majority of titles. So you see here the 12900K, if the games do demand all those cores and all those threads, then it will slightly lose to the 7950X. But this is the precursor to what we will see with a lot of these different benchmarks. Then we'll start this off with CSGO 1080p lowest settings. And here's where the Ryzen 9 7950X comes out in top with, I wouldn't say it's a sizable victory, but it is a victory nonetheless. But at this stage, I think if you're going for CSGO 600 FPS or even the Ryzen 5 3600 at 500 FPS is going to be ample fine. So I think we're starting to get into the realm of, okay, how much FPS do you actually need? Though if you have an E reputation to keep up and you want the best CPU for the job, at least for CSGO, this is going to do it. Though onto the next benchmark here, we've got Far Cry 6 which is 1080p lower settings. And we use the benchmark tool here. And what we saw was the Ryzen 9 7950X did come out on top and the 1% and 0.1% lows were actually fine in this game. I did have problems, however, where I talked about initially when I was testing this CPU, and this is why my review was late, I did come into problems where I was having stuttering issues. And I did fix that. I'll put the link to the video up here if you wanna know more about that problem, but it was essentially due to Windows 11 update. Even though with that update on, when I compare the average FPS numbers to the average FPS numbers I got pre-update, they're actually higher on the stuttery mess Windows update than they were pre-update. That's a very bizarre thing. I haven't seen behavior like this ever in the history of PC gaming and testing CPUs or graphics cards, but I guess there's a first for everything and I decided to test with the much smoother 1% and 0.1% low numbers because that is what I feel the majority of gamers would rather be gaming on. Though speaking of stuttering and lower 1% and 0.1% lows, here's where Horizon Zero Dawn was the anomaly of the benchmark games, even pre-Windows update with smooth 1% and 0.1% lows. And this scored 227 average FPS, but it did have a 147 and 123. Now, this was consistently lower than the other CPUs in the benchmark here, but I feel like we're getting to the stage in this benchmark where the game engine is perhaps starting to break a little bit. The next game is Shadow of the Tomb Raider, and here's where the 7950X yet again scored a victory. But you'll notice the 5800X3D is also coming to the top of the charts and also with better minimum FPS. So this is gonna be important when we make the recommendation in today's video. The last title we tested was Apex Legends, but what we got here was the Ryzen 7 5800X3D I found after a long session was the best performing CPU in this title, then followed by the i9-12900K, then followed by the Ryzen 9 7950X. However, all three of these CPUs do come close to that maximum FPS limit of 300. So there is a little bit of variance in this title, but again, all three of these CPUs, just like we're seeing with most of the games out there, they're all doing phenomenally well. I also threw in the undervolted figures with a 4.8 gigahertz all core, which will pull up the power consumption figures, will save you a lot of power. And so this was only performing 10 FPS lower than the out of the box power hungry settings. And also if you want to undervolt your GPU, this is where you can save massive power savings in general. So I included this on the Cinebench results and also in Apex Legends, because this is what I'd be doing personally if this was my main rig and I had these two components. And with all those benchmarks done and dusted, it is time to give you guys a clean cut recommendation with the Ryzen 9 7950X. And here's where we've got to talk about the most important thing, and that is the price. Coming in at 700 US dollars, 
this CPU on its face value does look pretty good, especially if you are buying this for the productivity numbers. However, one thing to keep in mind is you will need a brand new motherboard. You'll need brand new DDR5 memory, and you'll most likely want to get a 6,000 megahertz kit, either CL36 or I know AMD was seeding out also CL30 kits as well, and they will set you back a lot of money too. And then, of course, on top of that, you've got a budget for a quite a big water cooler in my opinion i honestly wouldn't after seeing what i've seen here today wouldn't use anything less than the h170i from corsair that we used and that's a very expensive water cooler so you've got that 700 dollars cost but then you've got a 500 dollars motherboard at least 200 dollars on the memory at least 200 dollars on the cooler you're adding in another 900 dollars before you even get started so it does have a ridiculous entry level price even if you want to go with the 7600X, because currently you can only get these X670 motherboards and they are very expensive. So that is one thing I'm concerned about. Though as we saw with those productivity numbers, it can save a lot of time. And so if that's something that you need in your life, then is that price going to be justified? That's for you to decide. Though also to throw in a bit of a curveball into the mix, as we saw that Puget Bench, Adobe Premiere Pro benchmark, the iGPU with QuickSync, does give that extra productivity. So you may wish to look at which application you're using. For me personally, I use Premiere Pro, so the iGPU is almost priceless for saving me time and giving me extra productivity, especially when I'm snapping through and scrubbing through the timeline. Though that said, when it comes to productivity, I find a lot of people will generally just use one application or perhaps use two, but it's generally one or two. So do find out which those applications are for you personally, see how much performance you can get out of that and see if it's going to be worth it. So for productivity, the 7950X is a solid recommendation from me. However, I will put caution in the wind, just throwing this out there, that there's no rush to buy this as currently I'm seeing everywhere I look, the CPU is still in stock, the motherboards are still in stock, DDR5 memories in stock, and as we spoke about on the channel here, economic conditions worldwide have it so that people aren't in a rush to go out and buy expensive technology, especially for a home enthusiast or someone who has a workstation. So there is no rush in my opinion in that sense, but there's also no rush because Intel just announced their Raptor Lake and this has been rumored to have massive productivity gains as well. So I would personally just wait, see what the benchmarks show for that even if you're into productivity, because that may be worth your time as well, where we're not going to see another CPU upgrade from AMD or Intel for at least another year, especially when it comes to these productivity numbers. So for now, I feel like the ball is in the buyer's court, meaning the buyer has a lot more power in 2022 to pick and choose, as opposed to 2021, where if we look at the Ryzen 5000, for example, a lot of those CPUs were sold out, scalpers were scalping them, and it was just a bad market in general, especially if you were trying to get some work done and you needed an upgrade. Then now it's time to shift from that productivity recommendation to the gaming. And here's where I'm gonna have a different and almost completely different recommendation where we're seeing those numbers, even though we're topping the charts, we're getting slightly better FPS in some titles, I feel like it's just not worth the money, especially when the 5800X3D already exists, DDR4 memory is a lot cheaper, you can get a much cheaper motherboard, and also the CPU is nowhere near as power hungry out of the box as the 7950X is. So I feel like you can save a lot of money just by going with even AMD's own 5800X3D. And I feel like it's going to give you a more reliable experience going forward, especially with those high 0.1%, 1% minimum FPS numbers in games. Though also, if you are on more of an extreme budget, you've got options out there like the 5600, a cheap motherboard, 12600K, cheaper DDR4 memory, as well as using $20 CPU coolers. So these options and these routes just feel like a much better choice, even if you want the best FPS. So I feel like you would have to be an absolute madman to go down this path, which you guys have said in the past that I'm a madman, but... I'm more of a madman on the budget entry level stuff and I'll push the price as low as I can. This is definitely going on the other side of the spectrum where you're pushing the price as high as you can, but going for that little bit of extra performance. So I guess it's a reverse madman. 
Though the final thing I will state on gaming is that the current generation of graphics cards are coming to an end. There will be new generation graphics cards coming out with much higher rumored performance gains. So we can come back and revisit this comparison on the higher end for you guys and then reevaluate that recommendation though it's probably going to be remaining the same. And so for me, as it stands with the information I have at this point in time, it's currently a recommendation on the productivity, providing you can utilize that value. Then on the gaming, it's a definite no, given that you're only getting a little bit more for a big entry-level cost. Anyhow, guys, I hope you enjoyed today's review. If you did, then be sure to smash that like button for us. This one did take me a long time because I did want to get the recommendation right and also do let us know in the comment section below if you agree with us if you disagree with us love reading those thoughts and opinions as always though before we go i'll also talk about one thing that you may hear from a lot of different people it's sort of a controversial topic in my opinion and that is the upgrade path though one thing i will say about amd with am4 is they have proven a very good track record with providing a lot of value out of that initial purchase on a platform. So if you were someone who bought a high-end X370 motherboard, you would have extracted a lot of value over time out of that motherboard and that you could reuse it and say reuse it with better DDR4 memory after a while, as well as reuse it with a better CPU. As long as the motherboard manufacturer provided updates, you got a lot of value out of your X370 motherboard. With AM5 this time, it does look like you will be able to extract a lot of value out of that initial motherboard line, providing you get the BIOS updates. Though here's where, when it comes to upgrading, I'm gonna throw in the second curveball here today, and that is I just buy for now. I buy whatever the best value is at the time and then just use that hardware however long I can get out of it. For instance, my last uh, CPU that I used was a 7980XE from Intel before I went to the 12900K. That was my main CPU and I used that for years because Intel kept stagnating. And even before the 7980XE, they had fourth gen and they stagnated all the way up until seventh gen. So they didn't really give the end user a whole lot of value out of their motherboards. AMD, on the other hand, have proven that they do give a lot of value with AM4. But before that, they had their pile driver, their bulldozer architectures. So if you bought high-end motherboards then, you would have been in a similar scenario to Intel. So basically what I'm trying to say is, is that with upgrading, there's no guarantee that the next generation of CPUs will give you much better IPC and much better clock speeds. We're only hoping for that as enthusiasts or as people who want to get more utility out of our current hardware and upgrade it. Anyhow, guys, I hope you enjoyed today's video. I'll catch you in the next one. Peace out for now. Bye. This is like... We are going to have to act if we want common sense. This is like... We are going to have to act if we want common sense.